So, this is gonna be interesting. I mentioned this game like, what, twice before? And if you've seen those videos, then you most likely know the part of Halo 4 I really like. If you haven't, which is probably most of you, then I'm sure you can guess from what I'm most likely showing on the screen. But let's back up. I'm not just gonna talk about this stuff in this video. I'm also gonna be talking about Halo 4 in general. 343 Industries' first real step on their controversial path as the new inheritors of the mantle of Halo. Of course, I didn't even know most of this growing up, and I guess that's a good place to start. My first Halo was ODST. I remember my brother picking it up somewhere, maybe it was a Target while we were on vacation, but it's been too long so I don't really know. I think he didn't like it, so I ended up trying it out. And it freaked me out, that dark, depressing, noir atmosphere that I've come to love was ironically the thing that kept me away from it as a kid. Thankfully, I didn't end up playing the local multiplayer disc that came with ODST, and that's what me and my family, and I think a friend on at least one occasion, would play locally, and that was so fun. My favorite memory of that time was when it was me versus my dad on Avalanche. We were both in Hornets at the time, and I flew mine above his, jumped out, and whacked his Hornet midair with a gravity hammer. I remember the middle part went straight down while the wings flew up, it was fantastic. The gravity hammer and avalanche are still some of my favorite parts of Halo. I know most would say the sword is better, but where I'm from, it was the hammer that was king. Of course years passed and I would eventually find Halo 4 for very cheap, I'm talking single digits, at a GameStop. I brought it home and was hoping to try to make some new multiplayer memories with the multiplayer disc it had. For some reason it never worked, so instead I played the campaign, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. That was the spark that led me to go back and eventually beat ODST. Halo 4 was the first Halo campaign I've ever beaten, and probably was what got me more interested in Halo outside of the local fun I had already experienced. Although I hesitate to call myself a fan of the series till a bit later when I got Halo 5 Forge on my PC along with El Dorito. And then I went back to play Halo 1 Anniversary and Halo 3. Don't entirely remember the timeline and all that, so forgive me. I won't lie to you. I'm sure that my history with Halo 4 is the reason I try to find so much good in this game. And I found a lot of good, but I also found all the reasons people don't like this game. And I can't really blame them. Look, this is a more positive look. I'm not going to sugarcoat everything. But I am proud to see 343 finally coming to their own with Infinite. I just hope they don't leave behind the things that made their game special. Let us begin with the story. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but before that, let it be known that the Council of Halo deems me a heretic for the positivity I spill and the gold I find in this mine of salt, and I shall return to my eternal viewing of Garfield the Tale of Two Kitties as punishment. Well, I mean, I kind of actually like the movie a little bit. Look, I watched it a lot when I was a kid, and now I kind of have an ironic sort of liking to it. It's it's kind of weird, I'll be honest. Will you marry me? Nah. We open up on Dr. Halsey being interrogated on the ethics of the Spartan program by a mysterious agent. This is a decent way to open up the story as it ties into the theme of 343's saga for Halo. We get to actually see a little peek at the dark reality of the Spartan program and see how its origins as a way to qu quell? quell quell human rebellion through testing and experimenting on kidnapped children to then being seen as saviors of humanity is pretty interesting. After this we see the forward onto dawn after the events of Halo 3. The half of the great ship is being scanned and intruded upon by an unknown force leading Cortana, who's been all alone after the last four years, waking up her champion, Master Chief. After getting a synopsis on the situation for Cortana, Chief and his blue friend see who's behind this. They find a splinter group of the Covenant are to blame and that the half of the dawn that they're on is nearby a Forerunner world. After giving the Covenant a nice wake-up call, the planet, known as Requiem, scans Chief in the ship and starts pulling everything into itself. After the crash, Chief asks Cortana about her recent glitches. Cortana explains her situation as rampancy, and as we'll soon see, this condition will only get worse. Now Chief and Cortana try to make their way home to somehow find a cure. Along the way, they try to figure out the secrets of the planet they're crashed on and why the Covenant want it. 
Eventually, they get contacted by another ship called the Infinity, led by Captain Del Rio. But the signal is weak, so they can't warn Infinity about the planet. This leads Chief McCortana down to the center of this planet to try and figure out how to connect to Infinity. In the center, they find similar creatures to the Sentinels called Prometheans that are aggressive towards them and the Covenant. Let them fight. But it turns out the stuff in the center of the planet that was hurting the signal was also holding a Forerunner prisoner known as the Didact. And after tricking Chief and Cortana into freeing him, he takes control of both the Prometheans and the Covenant, and is now attacking the recently crashed Infinity. Chief tracks down the Infinity and helps them out, eventually leading him to the Librarian, another Forerunner who gives Chief a lot to process. Talk about a lore dump. She explains the Didex plan to compose humanity into more Prometheans for his army, and she also evolves the chief it's kind of stupid i'll cover it a bit more later anyway the chief and cortana want to stop the didact while del rio just wants to leave del rio is also kind of stupid too anyway it ends with chief and cortana fighting to stop the didact by themselves until the didact reaches earth and now the infinity can help because del rio was fired off screen and now lasky the guy who helped chief and cortana leave the infinity earlier is in charge Chief and Cortana fight the Didact, who gets teleported away after taking a grenade to the chest. And apparently he just teleports away just to go die in a book, I think. They really had to stop doing that. Anyway, Chief prepares to detonate a nuke to stop the Didact's composer, sacrificing himself for the Earth. But Cortana saves him somehow, uh, I let it slide because the acting is phenomenal, and sacrifices herself instead. And we end on Chief and Lasky talking about Earth and how soldiers are people too. Then we hear a speech from the Didact's past as we see Marines rush to help the people who just got cremated. Or maybe digitized would be more accurate. Digimated? Ugh, that sounds like a Digimon dating app. Oh, and Chief takes off his suit. That was a very streamlined version of the story. I left out a little detail here and there. I'm not trying to give you a full play-by-play -play of everything because you've most likely played Halo 4 before. And I just want to refresh you a little bit before I get started. But on the other hand, if you haven't played Halo 4, don't worry. I only left out maybe Del Rio's freak out here or sad scientist there. I left all the major stuff in. I honestly don't hate the story. I think the plot itself is good, but maybe a few things could be cut or switched around a little. Most of the stuff with a didact and librarian is just kind of lame. We get a huge lore dump that explains way too much that should have been fed to the player throughout the game instead. But even if the lore was spread out, it probably wouldn't cover everything in the terminals, which are pretty important to the story having critical details to the didact's relationship to the librarian and why he has such a huge distaste for humans. Now when the story isn't focused on the Forerunners and just goes back to Chief and Cortana, I think that's where it shines. Because that's just more interesting. Cortana's disease is slowly killing her and the Chief isn't sure he can even help her. They've been with each other so long and even though Cortana is the machine and Chief is the human, the roles have been flipped throughout most of the series until this game. In Halo 4, Chief's solid unbreakableness gets a crack. When something as close to him as Cortana starts to get hurt, his facade breaks a bit. It starts a small crack, but by the end, he's begging Cortana to stay. I know some people hate the fact that Chief emotes and talks as much as he does in this game, but like, I'm glad he does, because it genuinely is the best part of it. Like Lasky says in the ending, soldiers are not machines, and if we never get to see Chief Emote or feel something, that would have been so lame, like genuinely lame. If they had Cortana fading out of existence, and he just pulled a one-liner out of nowhere, that would have sucked. There's a place for that stuff, and there's a place for this. Speaking of, the voice acting in this game is incredible. Even when the characters are saying some of or doing some of the dumbest stuff, the feel of the voice helps me take it all, at least sort of seriously. Though Del Rio really could have used more development and more reason to just want to run from Requiem and the Didact. Everyone knows that Jen Taylor's Cortana and Steve Down's Master Chief, along with all the other voice actors, do phenomenal work in this game. But one scene in particular that stuck in my mind for how much it made me feel is the scene with Sandra Tilson, voiced by Adrian Barbeau. 
The scene where Chief tells her that they need to blow up years of her research is genuinely sad. Adrian and Steve did a really good job here, and I really enjoyed the end of the exchange. Can you give Cortana access to the station's supply manifest? What for? If we can't move the composer, we have to make sure the didact can't either. Oh, wait. We have years of work invested here. Inventory lists seven excavation-grade Havoc mines. Just one of those would turn this base into a pinata. I'm sorry, Doctor. Keep routing your people to the evac centers. Once we take care of the Composer, you won't have much time. I'll... Uh, make sure the nukes are primed so you can... detonate them remotely. Maybe next time you rescue us? You can give us more time to pack? Next time. But you know that Halo 4 has great voice work. That's one of the positives of this game that most everyone can agree on. Another thing that everybody can agree on is how the Forerunner stuff could have been handled better. Like, I've already mentioned that a lot of the plot elements that were hidden away in terminals should have just been in the game itself. Outside of the quick synopsis dump the librarian gave us, how kind of her to leave out things how she was the Didax wife and that kind of gives her a pretty big connection to our main villain. And what's with the Chief Evolving stuff and Gene's song? I can't get past that stuff. Why was that here? Chief is supposed to be an evolved, higher being now. But he's exactly the same except he can't be digimated. Cortana somehow was digimated in the ending and now she has a real physical body that she wished she did in the earlier game. Not entirely sure how, but maybe she had the composer in the 0.2 seconds it wasn't blown up? I don't know. What other characters haven't I talked about? I already mentioned Del Rio being underdeveloped. Oh, there's Palmer, who people give way too much crap to for the little height joke. I mean, she's just punching up a little, guys. Don't get so defensive. Though, maybe she isn't liked because of Spartan Ops, which I'm not covering in this video because you need friends to play with. I probably could get some to play with me, but I'm not a big fan of what I played solo, so I don't really want to bring anyone else in to play it. I haven't beaten it if you're curious, but I'm sure mm, some fans have, maybe? Look, the video is called More Positive. I'm not defending everything. Oh, right, Lasky, the second in command who helps the chief and even defends him in front of Del Rio. I like this guy. If he came to my birthday party as a kid, I'd ask my mom if he could have a Capri Sun. Was that the last strawberry kiwi? I'm sorry, Lasky. Oh, and of course, since this is a Halo game, the music and sound design is incredible. Listen to this assault rifle sound. Awesome. And speaking of assault rifles, I guess we should talk about gameplay. Let's start with the dreaded, unholy sprint. Okay, well you see, sprint. Walking faster is something that gets a bad rep for good and for stupid reasons. I personally couldn't care less if a Halo has a sprint or not, as long as the designs of the levels, you know, keep sprint- Fast walking in mind. Now if you did put a gun to my head, I'd probably say I'd prefer it if it wasn't in Halo and if we just had a faster movement speed. But it's nothing I'd ever really lose sleep over whether sprints in Halo or not. And I can already feel the mob I'm about to beat down because of this controversial opinion. This goes the same for armor abilities. Okay, I guess not 
as controversial. Again, I don't mind them. I think they can add a lot to the campaign for a few unique sections. And they can be useful for a variety of things. I'm not the hugest fan of it, but like I said about Sprint, it's not something I lose sleep over. I'd probably prefer them not to be in, but again, I'm not gonna lose sleep. In fact, the only way I'd say the armor abilities are flawed goes into multiplayer loadouts. I've only played 4's multiplayer on MCC, so I don't know 100% if this goes for the original or not, but there are modes in the multiplayer that don't have the loadouts, which, yes, I think are stupid for Halo and can break the balance a bit. And they are probably the primary reason the weapons feel so... samey? Now, Human and Covenant weapons have always had some overlap in uses, but adding in the Promethean weapons makes this overlap problem more apparent. Now I've always liked the idea that the reason the Promethean weapons are so similar to the human weapons is because ancient humans use similar weapons, and that's why the human Promethean thing weapons work because ancient humans are, well some of the Prometheans are made of ancient humans. And I guess that kind of works until you see the Forerunners use these weapons in the terminals, not the ancient humans. And even if that excuse was true, the gameplay is still hurt by this decision. Let me give you an example, the light rifle. It's a combination of the DMR and BR. That's a cool concept, but it gives me little reason to use either of those weapons now. It would have been better if the light rifle was the only DMR in the game. But then you look at the Covenant carbine, and now I'm wondering why it's here as essentially another DMR. They should have just used the reach beam rifle instead. Look at all three rocket weapons. These work a little bit better because they all have some sort of different effect from being shot. Three snipers are too similar if you ask me though, they can easily be swapped around with each other, and it wouldn't make much difference. The Promethean pistol is interesting with its shotgun secondary fire, but since the Prometheans already have a shotgun, it kind of overlaps with its own branch. The Promethean grenade is pretty terrible, it only really affects the AI opponents because they just stand in it for some reason. The Promethean Assault Rifle is pretty pretty lame, and so is the Covenant's new Assault Rifle too, they're both pretty eh. Luckily, Halo 5 revamped some of these Promethean weapons to be more unique or more useful, which is pretty cool. The humans get some new weapons in this game, including the Saw, which is pretty much a better Assault Rifle. I know, it's pretty boring and bland, but it's a bit of a guilty pleasure for me, I think it's super cool. And the Railgun, a faster Spartan laser pretty much. Why did they even add the Spartan laser back into this game if they were just going to replace the roll with a railgun? You see the problem here? Then we get to the enemies we actually fight. The Covenant have been slimmed down to just the bare essentials. Elites, grunts, jackals, and hunters. Kind of lame, but when adding in another faction to fight that ends up just being part of the same team as the Covenant, I can understand why. And besides, even without broods, I can still get this beauty. Now, the Covenant in this game are a group that splintered off from the original, but they act similarly, if not a little less expressive in their combat. It's kind of sad to see none of them really speak English anymore, I miss those funny little one-liners. Marines still have them though, so you may hear a few throughout the game. The Prometheans are interesting. I like the idea of the crawler as a four-legged dog looking enemy, that, that's pretty interesting. But they act more like jackals and grunts that just try, and succeed, to overwhelm you. The Watcher acts very similar to the engineers in ODST, and I like them in this role of a worse engineer that attacks you without suicide bombing. But the ability to bring other Prometheans back to life is going a bit too far. When Prometheans show up, there's always a ton of them. We don't need someone going around reviving what it took me 5 minutes to kill. Leading us to the Knights. I can't tell whether I despise or kind of like these guys. On one hand, the design of these guys is very cool and I like the idea of them. But on the other, I had less painful experiences pulling teeth than fighting these guys. And that's saying something because I once got a tooth pulled and I guess Bruce Banner over here was having an off day because the guy shattered the tooth before it disconnected from my jaw. The knights can be awful to deal with. They can teleport at any time and sometimes, just sometimes, that teleportation makes them completely invincible. The little knight dash can be either completely pathetic or heat-seeking nuke launch from the other side of Requiem. 
Sometimes they're easy to beat, sometimes they're John Wick with a ricocheting shotgun. Their biggest problem is how inconsistent they are. You never know if you're facing a total dunce or a total genius, and later in the game when they throw multiple of these guys at you, it's kind of unfair. I feel I should mention I played on Heroic for the main playthrough for this video, and I can tell you now, I don't recommend it for your first playthrough. I don't care which difficulty is canon. You're going to want to try normal for your first run. The AI in this game are so... odd. The same AI that pulls off brilliant strategies like this is the same AI that will relentlessly pound you with banshee bombs as soon as you give it the opportunity. Do the Sentinels count as part of the Prometheans? I mean, they are forerunner weapons, and the Didact does have a few under his control. Would have been cool to fight them a little. Oh, right, speaking of inconsistent, the weapons in this game have a bit of a problem. The ammo is... Uh, non-existent. I don't know if it's the enemies having higher health pools, or maybe I'm shooting two shots at a time and not noticing. But running out of ammo, at least in the campaign, is something that's going to happen a lot. And you'll find situations where you just have no ammo to your name and you're stuck behind what little cover there is being pelted by enemy fire. QTEs are also added in this game. And they're not bad, but they ain't great either. Making the didact fight a QTE was pretty lame. And there seems to be a problem with the dialogue if you don't complete them as quick as the game expects you to. Chief, be careful! What? What is it, Cortana? Hmm. Must not have been poor. Again, more positive doesn't mean I'm defending everything. However, I am missing one crucial gameplay element that is phenomenal in this game. The vehicles. Look, I'm a simple man. I like big machines. I'm similar to a kindergartner in that regard. Trains, dump trucks, tanks. Oh yeah, we are talking about vehicle levels. And Halo 4 has some of the best. I'm still kind of kicking myself for not talking about my love of tank levels in ODST. Though I can't really blame myself too much. The only tank section... I like in that game was the final one, and it's cool, but it's not really something that gets me super hyped. That being said, Halo 4 sections aren't that much better than ODSTs. But... Oh man, it's so cool to run around shooting everything unto death with this Mantis. Even the Knights can't stand up to this bad boy. Why don't we use this thing all the time? And oh, the Pelicans is so cool. It's about time we actually get to fly one of these and ooh, the Broadsword. I love this thing. The controls are great. The shooting is fun and flying around super fast is so cool. There needs to be one of these in this section of Halo Infinite. I need it. I remember seeing a meme as a kid thanking Halo 4 for making the best Star Fox level in a while. That's how good this is. But now it's time for how this game looks. Oh boy. Now, graphically, I think this is probably the best looking Halo game to date. Well, I say that, maybe Hiven it's better, but I won't know till that comes out. So we'll just continue on, like Halo 4 is the best looking one. Anyway, looking at some of the beautiful environments and structures on Requiem is jaw dropping. Like, can you believe this is a 360 game that is almost a decade old? Look at all this, it's wonderful, but be warned, the MCC version of this game does have some lighting issues that I'm sure they'll fix. Since they went through the Herculean task of fixing Halo CE to look like the Xbox original and not the PC version, that was amazing, V43, keep it up. Now, the art style is where everything gets a bit controversial. In my personal opinion, I don't think it looks as bad as some would say, for example, Chief's armor in this game looks really cool in my opinion. I like the detail and the battle damage that's visible on it. This armor just escaped the ending of Halo 3 and it looks like it. I know that's hard to hear for some because the extra detail in this game is one thing people don't like about it. There's also some things in this game where people swear up and down looks too different than the Bungie style, like the Elite's body structure. I don't see it. Like, the armor is different, but the elites are not bulkier or anything. They look the same. Now, the jaggles and grunts look quite a bit different, but why is everyone always talking about the elites? Now, there are some things I do dislike in this art style, such as the shotgun. I hate how it looks in these games. It looks like a miniature version of the Infinity. 
Okay, well I've talked about the Chief's new design, how about I talk about Cortana's? Cortana's design in this game is actually pretty cool, I like it. She's always been the naked looking girl made of code, and she definitely looks like it here. Although this is the first game where I think most really started to notice she's naked. Like, yeah, she's always been naked throughout all the games, but something about Halo 4's design really clicks that this is a whole naked woman. I guess that has to do with the machine or humanity thing going on in this game, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But the whole naked thing is a tad bit odd when you remember she's meant to look and pretty much be a younger version of the Chief's... I'd say adopted mother, but she kidnapped these kids. Anyway, it's kind of odd that the Chief's sword and mom made a naked version of her younger self to give to her sort of son. Especially when you remember the special function the suits have. They don't do that! What? The mirror in their armor does not jack the Spartan off. It provides a sexual stimulus to enhance the Spartan's combat abilities. Why are you laughing? So, so the suit edges him on the whole time? Is is that why he's always trying don't to... you dare. Finish the fight? I'm out of here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> man, they've got to stop it with these books. The rookie died in one, the didact died in the other, and now this whole edge thing. The books are not canon to me, boys. That, that's all I'm saying. <sighs> Halo 4 is not a masterpiece, but I enjoy it for what it is. There are definitely some aspects that could definitely use some work, such as the story or the gameplay, and let me tell you, the later sections of this game... Straight up made me wonder if I was having fun. But I was. I enjoy Halo 4 and I enjoy its theme. Are you a man or a machine? And that question ties everything in this game's story together. As Chief, a human turned machine tries to find his humanity, while the Didact throws all his away. And as mentioned before, the bond between Chief and Cortana is what makes this campaign worth playing. It's wonderful and it's the highlight every time I play this game. The gameplay is a bit rough, but overall really fun, which is a good way to describe Halo 4 in general. But you know, I don't think it deserves the hatred it's garnered over the years. I mean, you guys like Reach, it has a lot in common with 4. Hold on a minute! I thought you left. Halo Reach has nothing, NOTHING in common with Halo 4. I mean, sure, they have very similar art direction with very similar detailed designs, weapon bloom is very similar. Of course, armor abilities and sprint are in both, and they also both have like a, a kind of COD feel that they're kind of marketing towards. Is there a but here? The story is better in Reach. I think the movement in the field of guns is better in 4 than it is in Reach, and possibly 3. Do you mean sprint or the base movement when you say base movement? Oh. Yeah, that's understandable. But better feel than Halo 3? I don't know, man. Halo 3 has just been a little... Eh, the last little bit I played it. I still really like it, but I think I'm a little sick of it. I wish Bungie made Halo 4. You know, I don't think Bungie would have made that different of a game from Halo 4. Like, I think they would have done a similar thing to 343, right down to kill cams and assassinations when it came to adding Reach and COD elements into their version of Halo 4. Sure, they probably wouldn't have gone as far to make something like Halo 5, which would have been sad from a gameplay perspective. Gameplay perspective? At least we're gonna have that, but it seems to be having a lot of issues lately. Yeah, Infinite is like my most anticipated game right now. And I'll be honest, I don't want it to be delayed again, but I can't argue against those who do want to delay. I wasn't a big Halo fan when 5 came out, so... I learned about all that stuff a lot later than most, and I'm sure the whole No Forge or Co-op campaign reopened some of those old wounds. That 343 hasn't really fully healed yet. But they are trying, and I'm willing to give Infinite a chance. And although I do enjoy the new hybrid art style in Infinite, I am scared that like Bill Murray, 343 will look at their pieces of art and, you know what, forget the Bill Murray part, he has very good reason to despise the Garfield movies, and that's coming from someone who's only watched the second one. Drugs cost money. I'm trying to say, 343's games have just as much to add to Infinite as Bungie stuff, and I want them to have their own pride in their work, and not be 
you know, afraid to add their own stuff to Infinite. I'm curious to hear about Locke or Blue Team's whereabouts after 5, and I think 3 for 3 will have pride in their work a bit, looking at how they've already added their own flair to Infinite so far. By the way, the Halo Infinite helmet they added to MCC looks awesome. Yeah, that's all fair, I guess. Who are you, anyway? Oh, I'm a manifestation of the vocal Halo community. Oof, that sounds pretty rough. You have no idea. Sprint.